The Tom Woods Show, episode 2204. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hey, everybody. I'm giving away three free courses from my Liberty Classroom. One of them is ex-Marxist Michael Rechtenwald teaching you about critical theory so you can understand leftism and fight it better, as well as our course on how Alexander Hamilton screwed up America and the history of the conservative and libertarian movements. Check it out at 3freecourses.com. Hey, everybody. Tom Woods here. I'm delighted to be joined once again by our old friend John Wolfenbarger, who is founder and CEO of bullandbearprofits.com, a site I highly recommend. We got some crazy stuff going on in the economy, and I thought I would have him back to help us figure out what the heck is happening and what we ought to do in our own lives. So, John, welcome back. Thank you so much for having me back, Tom. It's always great to be here. What a wild situation this is. I mean, this is the craziest economy I've ever seen. I don't mean that it's the single worst economy I've lived through, but it is the craziest in that we have all these supply chain problems, which I think most people don't even fully get how that happened. They know that two years ago we had lockdowns, but we're having supply chain problems two and a half years later, and that's having ripple effects. We have businesses unable to find enough labor for some reason, even though there are still a lot of people around and they're not being subsidized not to work anymore, and yet still we can't seem to find them. We're being told that it's a robust economy by the White House because of job figures and such, But we've got price inflation going crazy, the stock market all over the place. I have a very good friend who's extremely knowledgeable, who does this sort of thing for a living, who's telling me, you know, I'm in the stock market. And he's telling me that if it were him, he would sell everything at this point. He would just sell and get out for the time being because it looks pretty crashy to him. Can you try to make sense of everything that's going on? (laughs) Thank you, Tom. I don't know that I can make sense of all of it, but I'll try to hit the highlights. This is an insane time right now for the economy. I think it's incredibly risky, and I think people need to understand what's going on and prepare for it. I think we could be in for what I would call meltdown 2.0. You're going to have to write another book soon, or if you don't, I might take a crack at it. But I think this coming recession, and I think it's going to start in 2023, I think it will be probably bigger than 2008. I think the stock market, bear market will probably be worse than 2008, 2009. So I think we're in for a very difficult time ahead. So I think we can go back to look back in history a little bit after uh, the financial crisis. You know, the Fed embarked on their crazy quantitative easing program, where essentially they bought long-term bonds in addition to short-term bonds. They did that every time the stock market went down or the economy seemed to be slowing. By 2017, short-term interest rates started to rise a bit. The Fed started to hike the Fed funds rate. By 2019, the yield curve had inverted. That meant the short-term rates were above long-term rates. And every time the yield curve has inverted in recent decades, in over 50 years, every time that's happened, it's led to a recession in six to 18 months or so. So we're on course to have a recession in 2020, but then COVID happened. And I think that gave the Fed an excuse to inflate the money supply at a rate we've never seen before in US history. The money supply growth based on the Austrian money supply growth developed by Murray Rothbard, that grew about 40% after COVID as the Fed just, they bought up corporate bonds, mortgage-backed securities, slashed interest rates to zero. And it was such an unusual recession we had because essentially the world government shut down the economy. And shutting down the economy did lead to supply chain problems. All of a sudden, people weren't working and you know getting things done that normally happens in an economy just didn't happen. So it takes a long time to bring that back. You know, capital expenditures for oil and gas development just plummeted, partly because, you know, the price of oil plummeted during that COVID panic. So COVID really started this thing with the supply chain problem, shutting down the economy. And then the big problem now is the Fed having increased the money supply by 40%. And now that's caused the highest inflation we've had in 40 years. So inflation has exploded, and that's caused interest rates to rise rapidly. And the Fed was very late to the game of rising interest rates. And they said that inflation was transitory. Don't worry about it. It's all supply chain issues, and those will take care of themselves. But you know, if the price of oil goes up or the price of certain particular goods go up, 
that doesn't lead to the, you know, eight or nine percent inflation. That can only happen with the huge increase in the money supply we had. So because inflation is so high, the Fed now has to tighten because they can't afford to let interest rates get to double digits like they did, you know, in the late 70s. If given the highest debt levels, you know, and federal debt and really all debt, if interest rates got back to 10% plus or more, it could be, you know, a far worse disaster than we had in the 70s and, and early 80s. So the Fed is now finally trying to tighten aggressively into a recession. Powell gave a speech, you know, Fed Chair Powell gave a speech late last month saying, even if we have a recession, even if we have a big bear market, we don't care. We have to tighten and bring inflation down. So that's what's going on right now. And I think there's a lot of risk ahead. Obviously, we can't predict with certainty what's going to happen with the economy because right. you know a lot of people have gotten it wrong. Nobody gets it right all the time. Nobody, even the best prognosticators, they screw up sometimes. So nobody Absolutely. knows exactly what's going to happen. But there are indicators that can be suggestive. And you named one of them, namely the inverted yield curve. Mm -hmm. Is that the main thing? Or is there anything else that tells you troubles ahead? I look at dozens of leading indicators. And uh, remember last time I was on the show, you asked you know, about Ludwig von Mises and how he told his wife he would write about money, but he would never have a lot of money. Because, And why was that since he knew so much about the economy? I think you know, to answer that better than I did last time, I think it's because he didn't have the interest. You know, he was much more interested in economic theory and think of for that. But he also, you know, partly didn't have, I think, as much easy access to data as we have now. There's a lot of leading indicator indexes that have been developed in recent decades that are very helpful and can predict recessions very accurately, or, you know, at least predict them coming within a six to 12 month period. There are some economic indicators that when they hit certain levels, that has always led to a recession. So for example, yes, the yield curve is one of the best ones. Again, we've always had a recession six to 18 months after the yield curve inverts. Yield curve inverted this summer. Money supply growth has slowed from, again from 40%. We're now down to about 5%. That's a huge slowing in the money supply. That always precedes recessions. You can look at banks tightening their lending standards. This is something that's reported and when it hits, you know, 30% of banks are tightening lending standards, that always leads to a recession. We're close to that now. Another one, housing market. The housing market, because mortgage rates have you know, more than doubled in the past year or so, the housing market is really starting to crash. The number of months of housing supply, you know, the housing supply, how long it would take for that supply to sell based on current sales rates is now 10.9 months. Every single time it's gotten over 10 months, you've had a recession. Another one, real manufacturing and trade sales. This is the broad measure of private sector sales. Whenever this goes negative, you have a recession. That's gone negative. So there are things like that, that every time they do happen, you have a recession. And when you have the weight of the evidence, you know, no single indicators, I would say perfect. But when you have five, 10, you know, I outlined 10 in a recent article. I outlined five of them in a recent Mises Institute article. When you have, you know, five, 10 or 20 or so of these proven indicators that only hit certain levels in a recession, when that's all happening, I think you can pretty safely say we're heading into a recession. And we have the Fed tightening interest rates and starting quantitative tightening very aggressively into this recession. So it's about as easy to predict a recession now as we've ever had in history, I think. And it's been said quite a few times that the Fed seems to be between a rock and a hard place because mm -hmm. if they persist in the status quo, then you've got the continuing of price inflation for consumers. Of course, if they create more credit, then that gets worse. But then if they try to put on the brakes, then the stock market collapses. I mean, they, and it seems unlikely to me at least that there is enough will to hike rates as high as would be necessary to clear out everything that needs to be cleared out. And so I don't know what winds up happening, but it doesn't seem like a really good solution is coming. Also, about inflation itself, price inflation, I'm curious about where you think that's going. Because in recent, I don't know, I guess weeks, we have seen gas prices at the pump coming down. But some people are saying that's because of an ongoing depletion of the strategic petroleum reserve rather than because of any real fundamentals. And so maybe mm -hmm. they may actually go back up. And meanwhile, there isn't really a letting up in other areas of consumer prices. So can you talk about where you see that going? Sure. Let's see. Well, first of all, you know, the big picture is what really kills inflation or brings inflation down is a recession. 
every time you have a recession, inflation comes down significantly. That happened yeah, in the but 70s. Yeah, but what about, what about stagflation? Couldn't we have stagflation? Absolutely. Well, in the 70s, you had high inflation during the recession. But if you look at the charts, you know, after the recessions ended, generally the inflation came down. So the weakness, the economic weakness, what about by a recession, eventually leads to much lower inflation. It could take a while. It might not happen during the inflation, you know, which is kind of the problem of the 70s. But eventually, inflation did come back down after those 70s recessions, like in the early 70s, 74 or so. But then it, you know, it came back up as another boom started. So I think eventually the recession we're going to have, I think, will lead to lower inflation. I think we can pretty confidently count on that. It's just a matter of when. Now, there's a chart I put out in a new article today. I'll just go through this quickly. So last month, inflation was 8.3%. Prior month was 8.5%. It increased 0.1% month over month. Anyway, if you just run the math, if inflation continues to increase at 0.1% month over month, eventually it starts leveling out. And it actually, you get to about 2% inflation from this you know, 8% level, you get there by the spring, by sort of May or so of 2023. So that is possible if we kind of stay at this rate. Now, you know, oil prices, obviously a lot going on there with the Ukraine war. I mean, very volatile, very difficult to predict. But those have come down, you know, 30% or so from their highs. And the Fed, you know, Fed really wants to bring down commodity prices. But what's really sticky right now, well, Food prices last month were up 11%, food inflation. I mean, that's brutal for the average consumer. Now, that's, of course, an annualized rate. It's year over year. Yeah, so year over year, you know, wages are not up 11%. So people are really, really suffering. That's why consumer confidence is at 40-year lows or so. It's really bad. Anyway, so inflation can come down, but you have what's very sticky is about a third of the inflation CPI component is housing. And housing, you know, has been on a tear since COVID started, you know, house prices, you know, record levels. And that's inflating. The inflation number is there about 6% or so. That's going to be pretty sticky because housing, uh, you know, it's going to take a while for housing to come down. Again, I think we're starting to see signs of a housing crash. Housing starts are falling significantly. New home sales are falling significantly, et cetera. But prices haven't really started to come down. So I think it's going to take a while. I think we have probably six, you know, I would guess at least six more months, of pretty elevated inflation. But I think it will start to come down, you know, probably meaningfully, maybe by the spring, probably by the second half of next year, particularly if the Fed, you know, if they really pursue quantitative tightening and and the interest rate, they're talking about raising rates, you know, to 4% or so from, you know, we're about 2.3%. So, you know, doubling interest rates probably over the next six months. I think we will see inflation come down, but I think it really depends on how aggressive the Fed is. But Powell, again, just gave this speech. It was a very short speech a few weeks ago. Because the market was rallying and he said, look, you're not listening to me. We, <laughs> we finally got the message. We really need to bring inflation down and we're going to do it, even if it means a stock market, bear market, even if it means what he called pain, which is much higher unemployment and a recession. So he seems to understand it because, again, I think he doesn't want to have 10% plus interest rates and have a major fiscal problem and have Congress start coming to the Fed and saying, what are you guys doing? Maybe we should... You shouldn't have as much independence as you have. So he's really concerned about Fed independence. He knows he needs to get Congress off his back. He needs to keep interest rates from exploding from here. They've already risen quite a bit. Now for a message from our sponsor, BetterHelp. We've all been there. Something goes wrong. And then shortly thereafter, another thing goes wrong. And then another thing goes wrong. It can be hard to stay in problem-solving mode and not fall instead into overwhelm. Well, a therapist can help you become a better problem-solver And that makes it easier to accomplish your goals, no matter how big or small. Now, no doubt there's been a stigma associated with getting this kind of help, that if you were strong and successful, you wouldn't need it. Well, I can tell you it's done me a lot of good. First, when years ago I was coping with some grief, and then also there was a time when I just needed a neutral third party to talk some things through with. Somebody who wasn't going to yes me to death, but who was going to listen to my story and give it to me straight. And if you're thinking of giving therapy a try, BetterHelp is a great option. It's convenient, accessible, affordable, and entirely online. You get matched with a therapist after filling out a brief survey, and you can switch therapists anytime. Problems you may have thought were intractable can be solved, and that includes stress, anxiety, depression, and more. When you want to be a better problem solver, therapy can get you there. Visit betterhelp.com woods today to get 10% off your first month. 
That's betterhelp.com slash woods. Can we shift gears for a minute and talk a little bit about Europe? I mean, we know about energy issues in various parts of the U.S., but we are hearing an awful lot about an upcoming or not even upcoming, but already underway energy crisis over there. What can you say about that? Yes. The good thing for the U.S. is that Europe is even worse situation. (laughs) So it's bad in the U.S., but Europe is looking really scary. Europe also has similar high inflation and the ECB. Inflation was 9% in Europe in August. It's likely going to be at least 10% in the coming months in Europe. So it's even worse than in the U.S. And the ECB is even further behind the Fed in raising rates. Rates have been negative for seven years in Europe, and they just raised them to 0% in July, and now they're at positive 0.75%, the ECB's key lending rate. So they're just getting started on raising rates. And as you know, European debt crisis here with higher higher interest rates in Europe, that could be very scary for European governments. And on top of all that, we have this energy crisis. Obviously, it was started by a particular, much worse energy crisis than in the US. So electricity prices in the euro area are 10 times higher than normal levels, 10 times higher than U.S. levels. And they're higher now than they were during the energy crisis of the 1970s. And that's because you know, Russia is essentially going to cut off a lot of the gas shipments to Europe in retaliation for the sanctions that our governments have put on Russia, which obviously are not stopping this war. So all that's really happened with these sanctions is Europeans are, are going to suffer mightily with incredibly high energy prices. It's estimated uh, could be a 2 trillion euro hit to Eurozone GDP, which is 16% of Eurozone GDP. So essentially 16% of GDP going up in smoke with higher uh, energy bills. And the real concern for this, in addition to you know, being devastating for the average European consumer and hurting European you know, spending, the real concern is that energy companies, utilities, electric utilities in Europe, you'll see massive bankruptcies of these companies who they're not able to raise their rates. You know, their their revenues are regulated by the government, but they're having these huge cost increases. So there's concern about massive bankruptcies in Europe. One Norwegian energy company said there could be margin calls to cover energy trading of one and a half trillion dollars, which is 12% of euros on GDP. And the ECB is now talking to European banks about their ability to survive a potential kind of tsunami of energy company bankruptcies. So energy company bankruptcies could really lead to a major European banking crisis. And again, this is going on with the economies weakening, heading into recession, and ECB having to hike interest rates aggressively going forward. So, you know, this really gets back to Ludwig von Mises' insight that one intervention leads to another. You know, it's like one thing after another, one mistake leads to another. They just, they won't admit defeat and just, free the market. (laughs) They have to keep doing one thing after another. Now they're talking about limiting the consumption of energy by 10% for European consumers. Uh, I think France said people shouldn't wear ties to the office because, you know, that costs money to clean the ties, you know, things like that, micromanaging people's lives. So it's just one intervention after another. And, you know, I think Europe's going to definitely be worse off than the US. I spent a week in Scotland earlier this month and I read over there in the Herald, that this is a quotation, for some areas of Scotland, the forecast rise, by which they mean in energy prices, would wipe out the take-home pay of the average Scot for over three months. I mean, that's crushing. And several days we were there in Edinburgh, we walk just out of our hotel, not a hundred paces, and there was a guy from the Scottish Socialist Party with a bullhorn shouting and holding a rally to end what he called fuel poverty, talking about this exact problem, that the average Scot Mm -hmm. can't afford energy. Now, of course, his solution, it's funny, the socialists think they're cheeky and (laughs) anti-establishment, but I'm sure they also want to shut down all the traditional sources of energy, so I don't know where he thinks the relief for this is going to come from. I mean, he's, they're the defenders of the working man, but they're going to side with John Kerry and you know, all, you know, the <laughs> WEF and everything. You know, yeah, you're real champions of the, of the working man, right? But yes. so this is an overwhelming problem. And it is, would you say, 100% self-imposed? Absolutely. I mean, the Ukraine war and the sanctions 
are the main factor, obviously. You know, again, the US isn't having this problem. So it's not just the cost of, you know, oil and gas, it's the cost of getting gas into Europe because Russia has shut things off. So, you know, sanctions worked. Cuba wouldn't have been a, still be a communist country after all these years, obviously. You know, sanctions, as you know, don't work well. These don't seem to be helping Ukraine or helping in this war. And it's completely hurting Europe in a massively destructive way. And then it's on top of all of the, you know, alternative energy shift, you know, to fight climate change that Europe has been heading towards. And, you know, Europe is shutting down a lot of nuclear reactors, even though nuclear energy, you know, has virtually no carbon emissions, but they're just shutting them down because they want to go towards alternative energies other than nuclear. So we're having, you know, Germany's now saying, oh, maybe we won't shut some of these reactors down over the winter because we really need them. So all these policies try to get away from fossil fuels. Now they're realizing, oh my God, without these fossil fuels, we're going to go bankrupt. And so again, it's one intervention after another by the governments and and it's hard to see, <laughs> it's hard to see them waking up to reality and fixing this problem anytime soon. All right. Well, back to the United States. You're an average person. Let's even say you're an investor. Obviously, you're going to get this question. In this insane situation, why should I not just take my money out of the stock market and just sit on it? Well, yes. I mean, what can you do with your money? So first, I do think housing, you know, I think housing prices are at risk. Hopefully, you know, not as much weakness as we saw 2008, 2009, because, you know, I don't think the epicenter is quite at, at the housing level. And and equities, equity is housing, equity is better, et cetera. The banks are better capitalized. So hopefully housing won't take as much of a hit. But I think, you know, housing, I'd be a little cautious on right now. Obviously, if you leave your money in cash, you're losing out to inflation. But it's better to keep a stable <laughs> cash level than, than lose, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50% or more in stocks. You know, bonds have been very bad this year. You know, bonds, it's just like the 70s. Bonds were a terrible place to be in the 70s. They were not a safe haven when you have inflation like this. So cash is tough. Bonds are not good. Commodities have been good. But again, in a recession, you know, oil had skyrocketed through the first half of 2008. And then it just plummeted once we were about halfway into that recession. So commodities, I think, are very risky as this recession takes hold and industrial production starts to fall. And stocks, again, there's a measure of stocks. I think I mentioned it last time. It's If you look at the total stock market capitalization divided by GDP, it predicts the 12-year annual returns for stocks very well with about 90% accuracy. And this is, you know, this has been studied quite a bit. And over the last 100 years, it's predicted to 12-year annual returns quite well. This ratio is, again, near the highest levels it's been in history as the Fed, you know, pumped up the stock market with all this quantitative easing. Based on this level, stock market, the S&P 500 is likely to be at least 40% lower in 12 years. 40% lower in 12 years. Now, I think we're going to have probably a big bear market in the next year or two. Then we'll have another, you know, big bull market rally. And then we'll probably have another big bear market before the 12 years is out. So you finish at 40% lower. You know, in the, in the 30s, you had a big bear market. Then you had a huge bull market. And then you had another bear market. Same thing happened in the 70s. Same thing happened in 2000, 2008. So I think we have at least a couple of big bear markets over the next 12 years. You know, a nice bull market in the middle. So I think investors have to be, I think, just buying and holding stocks, which has been an incredibly great strategy for a while now. I think it's going to be very hard to do that and make money over the next 12 years, given where valuation levels and given all of these economic concerns. So I think investors have to be much more active, much more tactical. And, you know, so in bull markets, you know, when you see the signs of a bull market, economy getting better, et cetera, you can buy stocks, you can buy good mutual funds, good, you know, stock ETFs. But in bear markets, particularly the one we're in now, I think stocks could fall at least 40% more from here. I really do. And the best way to make money in that situation is to buy inverse ETFs that go up when stocks go down. There's one that's an inverse ETF of the S&P 500, a ticker is SH. There's one that's an inverse of the NASDAQ, ticker is PSQ. So, you know, those are some things you can do now to profit from a bear market, which didn't exist. They came about you know, around 2008, 2009, but they didn't exist prior to that. So this is an easy way for the average investor. You can just buy these just like you're buying any other stock or ETF. And so that's what I'm recommending to my readers is, you know, instead of losing money in stocks, try to make money by investing in inverse ETFs. And then when we get the signs, the economic signs, as well as the stock market signs that a new bull market is starting, then we can switch and go back into traditional long 
stocks and ETFs. Tell people, just take a minute to talk a little bit about bullandbearprofits.com. Sure, thank you. I've been in the investment business for about 30 years. I was a stock analyst. And so on my website, everything is completely free. Uh, you can sign up. I write articles every week about what's going on, like we've been talking about. I have webinars, I have special reports to go in depth on learning about all these different indicators and learning how to, how to identify when a bull market is starting, when a bear market is starting. And then every month, I recommend up to 10 new stock and ETF ideas, investment ideas. I, I recommend them and when to sell them and what price to sell them at. And I you know, analyze them. And uh, I send out email alerts with these recommendations. So I provide a steady stream of recommendations and a lot of analysis on what's going on economically and in the markets to try to help people you know, make money no matter what is going on, because these are really difficult times and, and it's hard to see them getting a lot better anytime soon. It seems like one crisis after another, very volatile situation for investors. It's not going to be a smooth ride going forward. So I really think there's a need for people to understand how to identify with these leading indicators for the economy and for the markets when you're shifting from a bull market to a bear market. You know, I saw it coming this year. And I still think there's quite a bit more to go, but I'm very focused on identifying when the next bull market happens and when, you know, can make a lot of money that way. So, so that's the purpose of the website. I have tons of free educational material, lots of recommendations on there. So please check it out. And you can send me emails, ask me any questions you have, et cetera. Well, of course, I'll link to it on our show notes page, tomwoods.com slash 2204. This is a case, folks, where you need the division of labor, just as you do anywhere else in your life. I mean, I don't do my own plumbing. I suppose I could. I could get a book and, <laughs> and learn that. I would have a lot better luck doing my own plumbing than doing my own money management, that's for sure. But, <laughs> but I generally don't. I let somebody else who has specialized knowledge do that for me and do pretty much everything for me so that I can focus on things I'm good at. And to be a good investor, you have to have a lot of knowledge. Like You have to know Absolutely. about the various companies involved and you have to know about trends. I mean, I just had my friend Larry Lapard on the show, and he was saying that for him, the key is staying ahead of the trend so that by the time mm -hmm. the trend hits the headlines, a lot of the Absolutely. juice has already been squeezed out of it. But if you can see the trend before others, like for example, he says, look, you know, like it or not, we may have an all-electric fleet of cars in many countries in the world mm -hmm. in the relatively near future, and they're going to need lithium batteries. So, well, what does that tell you about a certain product whose companies you might want to invest in? That kind of thing. But I, there's just no way I have the time. I, you know, I'm a dad, I'm a husband, I'm a podcast creator, I write a newsletter. So I have a handful of people I trust and you're one of them. Thank you very much. Thank you. No, it's a full-time job. It's a full-time job for me. I mean, it's a lot of work keeping up on top of, you know, I look at hundreds of indicators. I, every day I look at hundreds of indicators to make sure I'm on track and looking at leading indicators, as you say. You need to be ahead of where the puck is going, as they say. So it's a lot of work. It's a full-time job. And, you know, there's no way that the average person with, you know, another job could do this. So that's why I try to distill everything down and, you know, kind of easy to understand, you know, articles and webinars and that kind of thing. And I try to make it as simple as possible for people, but let them know that there's me and, you know, there's other people out there too, but there are people like me who are looking at this stuff full-time and trying to figure out where things are going. Because I have to invest my own money. I don't want to go broke. So I'd like to invest my own money. And, I need to figure out first and foremost what to do with my money. And then I figure I can help help other people as well who don't have the time or the experience, the knowledge that I do. Right, right. Now, the thing I stay on top of, I stay on top of libertarian gossip, but that ain't going to make anybody <laughs> any money. So I'm glad you're staying on you're top of something a little bit more practical for the world. So <laughs> thanks again, John. I appreciate your time today. Thank you, Tom. Appreciate it. Take care. All right, everybody, that's going to do it for another episode of The Tom Woods Show. Check out bullandbearprofits.com and I'll see you tomorrow. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at Podsworth.com.